I'm Melissa Gilliam. I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost, and I'm really excited to see all of you all. And this is a really a special occasion. This is our inaugural Education for Citizenship address. How many of you are new first-year students? Yes! Awesome. So um, we're really here for you. And um, welcome everyone else, but we're really here for you. <laughs> so we expect that this address will become one of the hallmarks of the autumn semester. Um, and so this is just the beginning, and so we're really excited that you all are here to be a part of this. And um, because it's so important, we went straight to the Ohio State motto, Education for Citizenship. And, um, you know, what this, this is about is the opportunity for this university to think about what it means to be an engaged citizen in the future. And so this is a really lofty and un uncompromising goal. And it calls upon you to use your education to be the model citizen for how we'll interact and operate in a changing world. And to really think about how we leave it a better place than the one you found. And so I um, had the opportunity to speak at Convocation a week ago today, so you've been here already for a week, and I talked a lot about this topic of civil discourse. And, you know, civil discourse is a conversation in which there's a mutual airing of views without rancor. And it's an unspoken understanding that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, and even if you find them disturbing, um, that you treat one another with dignity and respect. And so as a first step in fulfilling this motto, it's committing yourself to a practice of civil discourse as you exchange perspectives with others who don't necessarily agree with you. And so this, ev this evening's Education for Citizenship address really memorializes this by formally launching this project. And throughout the year, we'll have other opportunities to engage in this topic and with others and learn how they think. But um, I am delighted that this evening we have expert help. Um, and this really gives me an amazing opportunity to introduce Dr. Winston C. Thomas. And he, Winston will deliver our inaugural address. So Dr. Thomas is an internationally regarded philosopher of education. And since 2018, the Department of Education Studies in Ohio State's College of Education and Human Ecology has been proud to count him among our faculty members. Winston coordinates the conversations on morality, politics, and society program in the Center for Ethics and Human Values, where Winston is also a member of the steering committee. Before coming to Ohio State, Dr. Thompson was a faculty member in the Department of Education at the University of New Hampshire, and from 2016 to 2017, Winston was a fellow in residence at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard. Previously, Dr. Uh, Thompson taught at New York University and at Hofstra University. He is on the executive board of the Association for Moral Education and is the president of the New England Philosophy of Education Society. There's even more. Um, Dr. Thompson studies the ethical, social, and political aspects of justice, education, and the public good, and is especially interested in the dilemmas of educational policy. A current Burke project explores a new approach to democracy within pluralistic societies. A defining characteristic of any democracy is the civility of its discourse. And Dr. Thompson's deep expertise in this area makes this the ideal voice to encourage you to think about the challenges, responsibilities, and opportunities that will come, that come from being part of our diverse academic community. He is the right guide to lead you in becoming thoughtful citizens fully capable of engaging with different perspectives and can help us all better understand the true and profound meaning of education for citizenship. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Winston Thompson. Dr. Thompson.
Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I'm deeply delighted to have been invited to deliver the inaugural Education for Citizenship address. Traditions are extremely potent in their ability to frame and motivate the actions of any institution. And I take a real joy in knowing that we, you and I, are together building the foundation of a new tradition, this annual address that will shape aspects of our Ohio State University and its community for years to come. And I suppose it's with an eye towards that future that I should also name my excitement for the short-term horizon of this new academic year. For me, there's always an energy, spirited and lively, as the end of August approaches. So as I look out this evening at all those who have gathered here, I'm gratified to see the familiar faces of cherished colleagues and friends, and to see my spouse, Lynn, alongside the new faces of recently arrived faculty and staff. And I'm especially thankful for the presence of incoming students. Students, you're a core part of what makes the fall so fulfilling. The possibilities and the potential that arrives with each new class revitalizes us all as we envision what might lie ahead for and because of you. As I look out at all of you this evening, I cannot help but think back to my own experiences as a first year student. Of course, there was very much that was dissimilar between the external world then and now. The tone of national politics seems almost quaint by comparison. Uh, social media hadn't yet arrived to blur the lines between private and public interactions. And the fewer comparisons that we make between that economy and this economy, perhaps the better. But still, on a more personal scale, a good deal was quite the same. I think some of my own internal feelings and worries were probably shared by many of my classmates, and I imagine are likely felt by the new students and staff and faculty, if they're being unguardedly honest. You know, I was nervous about joining a new community. The rules and norms of that context were not always entirely transparent to me. Would I do well? Would I find real connection amongst my peers? Would I develop a sense of belonging? Would I find people who were, in a meaningful sense, like me? Well, imagine my surprise when I received my uh, roommate assignments for the residence hall. I was slated to live in a less than desirable triple room, so myself and two other students. I say less than desirable, it's a different institution. If you're in a triple room here, uh, it's luxurious and wonderful and you'll have a good time. But, uh, so me and two other students in this room, and uh, my roommates' names were included on that letter. One was named Winston, and the other was named Charles. And now you've seen my name in print, right? Uh, Winston C. Thompson. And, and the more perceptive of you might be imagining the truth that I'll now confirm. One of my roommates shared my first name and the other shared my middle name. Okay. What you wouldn't also know is that I grew up in a family that primarily used my middle name in referring to me, so it's always been a salient and uh, uh, intimate uh, moniker for me. So there I was, as a new student, with two roommates who, in a literal sense, seemed to share identities with me. So perhaps my search for belonging, right, on this uh, university campus was concluded before move-in day, right? After all, it's hard to imagine a more tailor-made campus home than amongst my namesake roommates. But these likenesses were superficial. And despite their nominal similarities to me, my roommates were rather dissimilar and they didn't get on well with one another, as can sometimes happen. Winston was black and had grown up in the more cosmopolitan and urban region of the state. Charles was white 
with a more rural upbringing in a far less diverse area of our home state. And of course, their freedom to express those differences was part of what makes a university experience so valuable. But I also came to understand that these valuable expressions require thoughtfulness and they require care. Thinking back, I recall often serving as something of a bridge between their differing perspectives, their uh, political and social values, and their deeply held beliefs. I learned very much in trying to help them see one another's points of view, perhaps aided by the fact that though I never quite fully agreed with either of them as they argued with one another in that cramped triple room, but I could always see something of myself in each of them. Decades on, my mind often drifts back to that first year experience in that room, Winston, Charles, and myself. I'm still struck by the ways that we were seemingly similar and obviously different in consequential and reverberating ways. But I suppose it should not be a shock to my mind, uh, it should not be a shock to me that my mind drifts towards those interactions because my scholarly work reveals that I'm rather interested in the moral weightiness of the differences between people, especially in educational contexts like a university setting. You see, in my ongoing scholarship, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I write largely as a political philosopher interested in educational topics. Across many projects, my scholarship has combined public and professional concerns of educational policy with the normative insights of rigorous philosophical analyses. Simply stated, I care about figuring out what any of us should do, given the circumstances in which we find ourselves learning and living. Through these perspectives, I've maintained as a central feature of my work, questions of ethics, justice, policy analysis across cultures and contexts. Essentially, I care about figuring out how we can be and do good as we learn in this world. Given my work and my own experiences, as I thought about what might be helpful for me to share with new and continuing students, staff, faculty, I realized that it would be appropriate to spend much of my time with you in reflection on being a good student, particularly in a context of valuable free expression across the meaningful differences that exist between us. But before doing so, let me offer a few preparatory notes. Firstly, my remarks are about being a good student because that role is central to the life of a university. But I don't intend to address only those persons formally enrolled here on our campuses. On my view of things, we're all students in a way that is vital and important. Whether we're trying to answer questions on a midterm or in our peer-reviewed research or towards improving the performance of our infrastructures and our systems, students, faculty, and staff are all, in an essential sense, engaged in the activity of study and intentional learning. We're all seeking to better understand the objects of our focus, and perhaps this shared experience of study marks us each as students and us all together as a university. Secondly, holding in mind this foundational view that we ought to all attempt to be good students, I'm gonna suggest that there exists some set of virtues that we should all appreciate and from our respective positions attempt to embody. Sadly, 
with apologies to the other philosophers that I, I see interspersed in the audience. Uh, I'm not gonna give a fully jargon-filled and overly pedantic lecture on particular historical conceptualizations of these virtues. I'm gonna save that lecture for when I wanna check if my children still know how to roll their eyes at their father. I'll save that. Instead, I aim to provide us with some descriptions that might connect with familiar experiences of study and learning. More than this, I hope that my descriptions of a few different categories of non-traditional virtues might themselves become a subject of your own self-study in the time ahead. So, in thinking about study and asking what it might mean to be a good student, I want to suggest that in most cases, one ought to care deeply about knowledge. For some of you, this will seem obvious as it's especially appropriate for the various forms of study and learning that take place at a university. So this first category of virtues that I put forward for your continued contemplation are the epistemic virtues or virtues related to knowledge. I take these virtues to be representative of some of the traits, the dispositions, the values that are invoked as desirable for knowing, or perhaps more importantly, as we're in the educational context of a university, the process of coming to know, or uh, the continued engagement with the subject of increasingly deepening knowledge, which we might call study. The first of the epistemic virtues I want to talk about this evening is truthfulness. The virtue of truthfulness reflects a range of values, perhaps best described as a commitment to accuracy and a desire to have beliefs and utterances, which can be spoken, written, or otherwise enacted or communicated, that properly cohere with reality. This virtue may be considered the core virtue of the epistemic category, as it may well be the foundation of the other epistemic virtues. It's hard to imagine that one could truly be engaged in study if they were indifferent to whether they were getting closer to truth on their subject. Here, the good student should care more about grasping the truth rather than only appearing to others to be correct about it. While this might seem simple, I would encourage us all to mentally recall a time that we might have failed to demonstrate the virtue of seriously valuing truth, perhaps placing some other more convenient aim in its place. The second epistemic virtue is openness. Openness as an epistemic virtue is certainly related to truthfulness. Though it might be right to think of this virtue as indicating the value of inhabiting a stance of potential receptivity to the new ideas, facts, and standards for knowledge that may present themselves to us when we are good students. Think back to a moment when your understanding of a problem or a phenomenon was transformed. When it became clear to you that the facts, as you had known them, were an incomplete or incorrect view of the matters at hand, that you were open to a new way of understanding things allowed you to honor your commitment to truth. But let me be clear, the epistemically open person isn't gullible or overly trusting. Rather, she's willing to be appropriately shaped by the epistemic content or criteria she encounters. Neither is she guilty of a corresponding epistemic vice, uh, you know, dogmatic insistence on a particular position in the face of compelling alternative evidence. I would hope that most of us would wish to find ourselves somewhere between these two extremes neither naively wide-eyed nor negatively walled off, but open in our abiding pursuit of truth. 
The third epistemic virtue is inquisitiveness. By the epistemic virtue of inquisitiveness, I wish to identify that tendency to actively pursue truth and use the disposition of epistemic openness in the service of that aim. Given this, the uh, uh, inquisitiveness might may be regarded in some mild respect as an emergent virtue, revealed at the intersection of the virtues I've already described. Here, imagine a person who claims to truly prize truth and seems authentically open to new evidence about it, but simply waits for that evidence to find them and carry them towards truth. They're a, a, a passive student. By nuanced but noticeable contrast, the good student is active and inquisitive as that epistemic virtue presses them to inquire or to learn. It motivates them to engage with the act of study as both intrinsically and instrumentally valuable. Yes, the good student likely finds intrinsic satisfaction in their relationship to knowledge, even as being a good student likely means one will use the instrument of their inquisitiveness to earn high grades or publish acclaimed articles and books or solve complex problems in their workplace. The good student across the roles that organize us might be well-defined by these, among other virtues. But of course, now that I've shared a few of the virtues that might mark one as a good student, you might be wondering how to develop or how to enact these virtues. I think this is a fine question to ask because knowing what we wish to become is only a partial step towards becoming that which we desire. So here, it can be helpful to do as I have already suggested, namely, to think about these virtues and try to recognize them in others and in ourselves. In addition to this, I would also add that it is crucially important to look to those around us as we're developing ourselves as good students, because we rarely study in absolute solitude. We're members of a vibrant and rich Ohio State community with resources aplenty to assist in our forward journey. For first-year students, this might be found in a valued instructor or a student affairs professional. For faculty, like myself, this could be found in our department chairs or our deans. Luckily, I've got great ones. And for all of us, this might be found in the institutional values that organize our efforts. For example, my own college is committed to five core pillars that have been immensely helpful in focusing my work and aligning my values through my continued studies. And for all of us across colleges and residence halls and our laboratories, it might be true that our university's shared values with which I encourage you to become familiar give counsel and shape to how we might move forward in together becoming who we desire ourselves to be. Indeed, in addition to our explicitly stated values, our university motto itself may serve as an animating ethos, giving direction for one of the most central, instrumental aims of our studies. Education for citizenship is a call to action and an invitation to be connected members of a learning community. Our motto suggests that our education, our studies, ought to lead us to become good citizens in our world. In thinking about how we might learn alongside one another towards becoming good students together, I'd like to quickly mention a few virtues of the good citizens we wish to be in the hopes that a clearer view of that outcome might aid us in its pursuit. The first civic virtue is tolerance. For our present purposes, tolerance can be understood as the virtue that allows citizens to endure the pain of divergent perceptions of what is right or what is good. I don't need to remind you that we live in a world of diverse perspectives and beliefs. 
living together can sometimes be exceedingly challenging and the virtue of appropriate tolerance allows for spaces in which we might all hear one another well. Though philosopher Bernard Williams named it the impossible virtue, tolerance gives way to secondary virtuous traits of mutual respect despite difference, and perhaps a willingness to shoulder what philosopher John Rawls referred to as the burdens of judgment. Essentially, uh, this idea might remind us that well-intentioned and smart people sometimes arrive at different, reasonable conclusions. So, especially in contexts of free expression, uh, we ought to be kind to those who disagree with us, and they ought to be kind to us as well. Described differently, tolerance is that virtue which creates the very context for our civic life. The second civic virtue is cooperativeness. The virtue of a willingness to cooperate with those with whom we, at the very least, tolerate or more fully celebrate provides an opportunity for actual work to be done with those who are our co-citizens. This willingness to work with others, even if we disagree with their reasonable views, finds us taking seriously their input in the mutual project of civic life and may open the possibility to consider the further conceptual category explored by philosopher Nancy Sherman in her work on the virtues of common pursuit. In essence, these virtues find some value not only in working together, but in the fact that working together and focusing on a shared goal is valued by those who do that work together. Imagine cheering alongside one another at a Buckeye game, and I think you get pretty close to that feeling of the deep connection to your peers as you focus on a good outcome for the entire community, and you recognize that they're focused on the same right along with you. The third civic virtue that I'll discuss this evening is loyalty. The virtue of loyalty might be one of the most difficult to navigate of the general civic virtues that I wish to discuss this evening. Now, I don't mean to present a version of loyalty that suggests that one is always allegiant to the current status quo, despite what might be entailed by or enacted through that commitment. Sometimes, good citizenship means breaking with what is popular or familiar, especially when we are shown its harm to others and to ourselves. Loyalty, then, as a civic virtue, should be understood as a tendency to remain committed to the best essence of our shared projects. Though the particular practices and priorities might shift, we can identify for ourselves, and we can identify for one another, the core enduring aspects of our shared civic identities. Cosmopolitans like classicist and philosopher Martha Nussbaum have given shape to what the practice of this conceptualization of loyalty might require of us in a diverse and dynamic world. So, these remarks on civic virtue has, have helpfully directed attention to understanding the goal of our education, our continued studies, as members of the Ohio State University community. It's good citizenship. But more than this, I'd like to suggest that we can appreciate a deeper, more elegant view of how we might all flourish and succeed as students. Rather than thinking of how being a good student might mostly instrumentally contribute towards our becoming good citizens after we leave our campuses, I'd like to suggest that the virtues of study and citizenship are significantly unified. Toward arguing that the virtues I've described might be understood as belonging to a unified category, I want to ask you to consider how these virtues share a substratum or a common root. I'd like to suggest that these virtues are all, in some sense, a manifestation of an underlying virtue 
of responsiveness. For our present purposes, the term responsiveness might be usefully understood as the disposition to readily and sympathetically react, reply, or be affected by in an appropriate manner. So, let's first consider the ways in which the civic virtues that I've already named might be instances of a particular type of responsiveness. Let's revisit tolerance. Exhibiting tolerance requires that citizens respond with sympathy to their fellows. Though one citizen might disagree with another, the disposition of responsiveness finds that citizen willing to be swayed by the facts of this difference, such that tolerance is possible. Without being responsively receptive to the other, or at the very least being responsibly receptive to the fact of the other's existence as dissimilar to one's own, tolerance collapses. How can you be appropriately responsive to those unlike yourselves? here on campus. Let's revisit cooperation. The responsive element of the virtue of cooperation might be self-evident, as the cooperative person must surely be affected by the influence of the other. To work with another party requires communication about and work towards a shared sense of the will of the group rather than only the will of an individual. Responsiveness is at the very core of any cooperative practice. How can you be appropriately responsive to those on your teams, in your groups, in your classes here on campus? Let's revisit loyalty. Loyal persons can be understood as having the appropriate response to the essence of that which unites them with one another. Just as it might be a vice to respond with hostility to the truly hospitable act, even if it doesn't align with your own preferences or perspectives, so too would it be inappropriate to respond with indifference to sincere attempts to recognize and respect the best versions of the essence of the community that we continually co-construct with one another. Taken in sum, the responsive citizen is responsive to the identities, the needs, the circumstances of her fellow citizen and their shared project together. Now, let us also consider the ways in which the epistemic virtues that I have already named might be instances of responsiveness. Let's revisit truthfulness. Desiring that one's utterances and beliefs cohere with reality can be understood as being truly responsive to the facts of the world. The responsive person is surely affected by reality, and they desire to respond well to reality's truths. Let's revisit openness. Surely linked to truthfulness, the responsive person not only desires to hold beliefs that respond to reality, but they also wish to remain open to new revelations about that reality and the standards for confidence and accuracy in appreciating or knowing it. The responsive person remains open to being affected, influenced, and shaped in the appropriate manner by the world as it is, and as it can be known by themselves and others from their social positions. So let's revisit inquisitiveness. As I stated earlier, more than passively remaining open, the responsive person is active in attempting to be appropriately influenced by the objects of her study. She wishes to have her beliefs changed, challenged and or refined in the service of better appreciating the subjects of her study. This responsiveness to the potential for knowledge marks my description of the inquisitive person. So, taken in sum, the responsive scholar or student is responsive to the facts of the world, 
the standards of knowledge about those facts and the process of study itself. Responsiveness, then, can be understood as a virtue with both these epistemic and those previously stated civic dimensions. The good student we desire to become is the appropriately responsive person. The good citizens we desire to become are appropriately responsive to the tasks of living with one another. And just as the good student is appropriately responsive to falsehoods that are presented as facts, I mean, here you can think about uh, the importance of looking at the evidence, right, and sharing it when conversing with, for instance, a flat earther, right? So too must the good citizen respectfully stand firm against views that, for example, deny the humanity of their peers or otherwise visit significant harms upon them. Being both a good student and being a good citizen means that we must be responsive to the world and to others. And it suggests that we need not wait for a specific context to perform either of those roles. Instead, let us focus on also being good students in our civic life, learning from and with our neighbors, even if we initially disagree with them. Let us also be good citizens here on our campuses, asking ourselves whether we are appropriately responsive to the influences of our coursework, the data in our research, the needs of our jobs, and the moral responsibilities to the larger social context in which we do all of this with others. Here, we might have a clear prompt to guide our activities in enacting both good scholarship and good citizenship. Are we being appropriately responsive? Of course, being good students and good citizens requires more than only the personal virtues that I've described here this evening. Thankfully, our institution offers resources in support of these very same goals. For instance, in addition to outstanding efforts from the Provost's office, uh, Office of Academic Affairs, uh, my good colleague from political science, Eric McGilvray, and others uh, through the Center for Ethics and Human Values have developed a framework for civil discourse on contentious issues. Also, my visionary colleagues, Mary Thomas and T. E. Morris, in women's gender and sexuality studies and African-American and African studies, respectively, have been successful in widening the range of perspectives and students in our community through their Ohio Prison Educational Exchange Program. These are just some of the examples of ways that we might pursue some of these, uh, these virtues. These and other resources are invaluably promising as we continually create a community characterized by free expression and appropriate responsiveness to one another that we should all wish to occupy. So, in closing, I continue to think back to my own experiences as a first year student, entering a new community while coming home to that crowded triple room with Winston and Charles. Though I shared names with those closest to me, it was my developing ability, I think, to be responsive to our differences that allowed me to see them and to see myself more clearly. As you spend time living and learning in your various roles across our campuses, I hope that you will not too heavily rely on the names and labels that you happen to share with those already close at hand. As a good student and a good citizen, you may discover that reaching further with openness and inquisitiveness about learning truths that challenge your own, with tolerance and cooperativeness characterizing your loyalty to the best aspects of our community, that reaching further than the boundaries of your own comfort zone allows you to better grasp the essence of education for citizenship as an Ohio State University Buckeye. Thank you. <laughs>